Because the first thing that may set me apart a little bit and make me atypical in my work and in my field is that I don't believe that my brain works any differently than anyone else's. I believe that our intuition is completely natural. And I believe that we all utilize it on a daily basis, even those of us who don't believe in it. It's as innate as breathing. Now, just because everyone can do it doesn't mean everyone should. It's a lot like singing. <laughs> um, but it's something we can all develop and something we can all work on. And that's what I do. That's what I specialize in. So I've been doing readings for about 25 years, and I know what you're thinking. You know, she started when she was six. Um, <laughs> I'll try to keep the comedy to a minimum today. You can't help it. It's something that, um, unfortunately, when we want to put some serious study into it, you know, um, there's paradigms around psychics that aren't that great, right? Even when I started looking, I was 20 years old, and I thought, well, I'm going to reach out there, and I'm going to look and see who's in my field. And what I found was a lot of things that I didn't resonate with. I found a lot of fear-based concepts around spirits, around energy. I found a lot of things that most of us think of when we think about a psychic medium, right? Big hair, fake nails, you know, sending people into the light. Um, I'm not here to judge any of that, but I've just never worked that way. As a matter of fact, doing this my whole life, I can honestly say I've probably just never seen an evil spirit. I don't actually believe in discarnate evil energy. It's like saying we have evil water, or evil wind, or evil electricity. All of these natural energies are just here, and we are made of all of this. On a quantum level, we are made of Earth. And we have these uh, beautiful internal systems. Um, and that's what the bioenergetics is. So I started into the Reiki path about 15 years ago. And I will fully admit, the first time I went to take a Reiki class, I remember thinking, well, you know, what's it going to do? Just laying your hands on somebody. What, what is that going to do? As with anything, it takes years, you know, it takes time to work with this and to understand. Um, when we are working with ourselves, psychic development often starts with wanting to understand what's going on out here. Most people want to learn this so they can get insights about their work or people in their lives. It always ends up that our psychic development leads us right in here. So how does this work within all of us? When I say this is completely innate, every person in this room is probably getting 20 or more psychic visions a day. The reason we don't recognize this information as valid is because all intuitive information comes in through the right hemisphere of the brain. This is also where we fabricate things. But it's a necessity, because this hemisphere of the brain does not need something to be real or tangible in order to entertain it. So the first thing I believe that we need to understand about our own development and about our own superpowers, is what I like to call them, is that we are polarized beings. We have two fundamental natures. We are supposed to. So many of the people who come in to see me for whatever reason, the biggest struggle that I see with human beings 
is that they're wanting to create this sense of oneness where they're of one mind, of one thought, where they feel that sense of peace, where everything inside is in the same place. I'm not saying that's impossible. I'm saying that uh, we, we're polarized. We are supposed to be. Half of our brain is there. It is survival focused. So when we think about that left hemisphere of the brain, and the brain is a muscle, by the way. It needs time to recalibrate. It needs time to accept new realities. It needs time to break down old realities. So think of that left hemisphere of the brain as an AM radio receiver. It has five channels. Its job here on this earth is to help us to survive. And its job is to filter out real and non-real things around us. So our ancestors didn't survive by saying, you know, I'll fight that animal later. I'm talking to my fairy spirit guide right now. <laughs> we need that. We need that discernment. We need that left brain activity. So it's very important. So this is the side, of course, that we call the ego. And I think the ego gets a bad rap. I really do. Um, thanks to um, systems that have come before us, it's been taught to us that the functions of the ego are to be avoided. When you feel anger, when you feel resentment, if you feel jealousy, if you feel any of those things, we're all suppressing that within ourselves. And what this is, is this is part of our information highway. This is part of the ego's way of saying to us, there's something around me that I'm discontent with. So let's first of all realize that these are important facets of who we are. If anger is running our life, that's when things are out of control. But this important system is there for us to embrace and understand and work with and simply observe. Um, so let's be at peace with that, first of all. So this side is, um, it's, it's here to keep us going. So when someone passes away, because really our, all we are is we're dense molecules, aren't we? We're dense carbons. That's what we are, molecules all stuck together. We shape shift from the time we're born. We all see things in the future. We all remember things from the past. So, so when we're here, we are molecularly dense. If a person loses 100 pounds, we don't more than that, do we? <laughs> it's literally the size of a small human being, just gone. We don't think of that as a death. What we do is we understand that they, they've shape-shifted. So my um, vision of what it means to pass over is simply that we change so much in that molecular density, like water vaporizing, we move above the veil. And the veil is just the highest level that that human side of our brain can detect. So luckily, uh, things like radio frequencies and satellite signals and everything that moves around us, we can't detect those. That's good. That would be very loud. Uh, so my analogy of where they go is basically like that. They're like these frequencies that are around us all the time. They're omnipotent. They're everywhere. They all have their own message. They all have their own station, just like we do. Uh, but they're right where they're supposed to be. And that brings me to my understanding of this concept of what happens when we get there. I understand that it's pretty much just like being born here, right down to going through the dark tunnel and the light and the people waiting at the end and you're not sure where the hell you're going. And my understanding also is that they are in a progressive real-time community and society. So according to our human brain, once someone passes away, it goes through that recalibration creates new neural pathways around the new reality that that person is no longer perceptible through those five senses. And according to that hemisphere of the brain, that person is now a non-reality. That person is about as real as a unicorn to us. Once they move above that veil, that's when the imagination comes in. That's when, that's the only catalyst they have for us to see them. The pickle, of course, is that that is where we fabricate things. And this is why a good portion of our society does not honor knowledge intuition, because the pineal gland, which is the third eye, is filtering it out. It's filtering it out as a non-physical reality. So when you hear people talk about opening the third eye, and I remember my parents talking about that when I was little, and I was very confused. I kept saying, I can't see this eye. <laughs> then when they said they had eyes in the back of their head, I got really confused. <laughs> 
The pineal gland is, it, it regulates the information between these two hemispheres of the brain. That's, that's what it does. And uh, again, as a muscle, we exercise that. So, the human ego likes external validation, doesn't it? As soon as we have anything happen, we come up with an idea, we develop a concept or a theory, um, we start to look externally. Because we learn from the time we're children that valid information comes from external sources. So, you know, school, um, religion, um, our parents. So that is what half of us is attuned to. So when we start to see things coming directly into our own mind, whether it's somebody that's passed on, whether it's a flash of something illogical that, you know, we can't quite put a place to it, that is your downloading process. So the first thing I do when, when I'm starting to teach people to be psychic or to develop this in a gift is tell them we're not here to decide whether this is right or wrong. We're not here to decide whether what you're seeing is accurate or inaccurate. Leave that for later. All we want to start doing, your brain's like a viewfinder. And the information that comes into my mind when I'm reading someone, when I'm looking for a missing person, um, can't find my own car keys, but I can find missing people. Uh, when I'm doing that, it's like slides. They just come into my mind. And all I do is observe and record and report. Sound like a cop. Observe, record, report. So when we start developing this, it's very important. What this does is it starts to develop a trust in ourselves. And that's what it's about. Collective change all really comes down to the individual. It comes down to the awakening of the individuals. So when we have people out here saying, this is my special gift. I'm a medium, I see dead people. Don't ask questions, this is my special gift. I don't resonate with that at all. I feel better if someone leaves a reading with me or a seminar like this, going and knowing that they have superpowers, that there's things there that they can do. We all have something to contribute. So in terms of where then we hold information. What do we do with information when it comes in? Our bodies and our minds are this profound database of information. We're making files constantly on everything that is around us. Now this system is here to help us get through life. So if I walk up and I kick you, I haven't kicked you yet, Marcy, but if I did, the next time you saw me, your subconscious would remember to avoid me, to keep an eye on me. So we're taking in this information all the time. Um, that system, that's what we call chakras, and uh, again, in New Age speak, that's what it is. You hear New Age people all the time talking about chakras. What these are, are like filing cabinets that we have in our system. And so when we talk about someone not getting over something, when we talk about holding on to stuff, when we have an automatic response to something that has more to do with what's happened to us in the past, this is this bioenergetic system that's working within us. I like to consider it like an information highway, not only between the different chakras in the body, but also from the quantum right up to the physical. Most of us here have an understanding uh, about psychosomatic illness, for example. You know, that if we hold on to things for years and years and years and years, you know, some people even just start to walk like this. You know, and that heart chakra gets really heavy. So um, the system is here to keep us alive when we face a crisis, when someone dies suddenly, when, when um, something happens that shocks that brain muscle. We can't possibly process all of that emotional impact right away. So what these chakras are is like a holding system for us. We go on to this spiritual autopilot. The full emotional impact gets stored here for us so that as the brain gets time to recalibrate and as it gets time to accept the new reality, it can come up in waves for us to handle a little bit at a time. Now, if we look in linear time in terms of healing, right, that can, we can really feel like we are regressing in terms of our healing periods. You know, anyone here that's had something bothering them from five years ago, the first thing we do is we judge ourselves. We wonder why we're not over it why it's still there. That's because of this, this system of energy that we work with. The same system can definitely work against us. 
if we are expecting things to repeat from the past. So this is what Reiki is about. And um, I kind of like terms and labels. All energy work is about bringing this up, looking at things. Expect if you go get Reiki, you'll probably cry for a few days and then you'll wonder, you know, why didn't that work? It worked just fine. <laughs> I've had people say, what did you do to me? I've been crying for three days. <laughs> Um, so in terms of this system, it's really important. I think the most important thing for us to do is cut ourselves some slack in terms of, again, who we are, what we're doing. Stop and realize that we are all profoundly powerful individuals and that it doesn't take a lot of learning. It doesn't actually take a lot of seeking external information. Has anyone here found that they can't find any books to read recently? You know, you're looking for books to read, you're looking for things to kind of inspire and get the mind going. That's because we're at a point energetically, I believe in humanity and in our history, that the universe wants us downloading new stuff. There's nothing wrong with the Seth material. There's nothing wrong with anything that we've, we've looked at before. Um, but our brains now, we're like a, well, we're like bat signals. <laughs> People who believe and have an understanding of how this works and who are willing to let themselves view, use that viewfinder, watch those slides that are coming in. It's increased recently. And uh, anyone who's hooked on to this has probably been aware that there's a lot of energetic movement, not only in our personal lives, but in the people around us. And you'll notice that when we are going through a shift, whether it be an individual or a collective shift, people seem to be either riding the wave or losing their minds. It doesn't usually go, you know, too much gray area in that. There's a couple things I really want to get to. Um, again, as a psychic medium, um, like I said, I, I've never done a protection on myself. <laughs> I don't, uh, when I'm going into a house where, you know, um, someone has called me and said there's all this activity here, I don't do protections on myself. I have never had any fear of this. Now, I'm not saying that ritual isn't important. Ritual is beautiful. What ritual does is it gives the human side an active role in our spiritual practices. So I encourage people to, to embrace any type of ritual that you feel comfortable with. However, as a practitioner, I don't believe that if I don't cleanse my room in between clients, that somehow this energy is going to lose track of what it's doing and somehow harm. I've never had that fear. I've had people tell me that I should, um, but here's my thoughts on this, on dealing with dark entities, poltergeists, evil spirits. Just consider adopting the paradigm that they don't exist. That works for me. <laughs> if they're out there, I haven't seen them yet. I don't, like I said, negate anyone else's experience, but the only demons I've seen come into my office with people are their own. I just don't believe in negative, harmful, natural earth energy, which again is probably typical in terms of my field. When we want to grow spiritually, it's a very hard thing to do when we are afraid that there are monsters out there, energetic monsters that are there to, to get us, to harm us, to um, you know, that we're becoming vulnerable to something that's negative. So uh, the ego is an interesting thing. And um, oftentimes our subconscious is trying to release fears. So in terms of dream work, uh, many people will have nightmares. And often these are what we call subconscious fear release dreams. On a daily basis, we all have a natural amount of fear. And it's often triggered by events that are around us. So we will see um, you know, that a family dies in a car accident. We will see that a child gets abducted. Our natural empathy, right? We look at that and we say, what would I do if that was me? That's horrific. It automatically sends prayer to those people. Um, we are all spiritual empaths on some level. Our energy is always on, automatic pilot. Um, I do want to touch on also, so much to talk about and so little time. I'd like to bring up the secret. I'd like to talk about the law of attraction for just a second. Did anybody make their vision board and it didn't work? 
B is that we are polarized beings. We have these opposites. We have these two hemispheres of the brain. We also know that in our external world, um, there, everything has to have a polarity. Nothing can exist without the opposite of what it is. So when The Secret came out years ago, um, of course I got in there too. I made myself a vision board, kind of pink Volkswagen, <laughs> all kinds of neat stuff on there. Um, what I started to understand when I looked at the polarities that we experience in, in daily existence, a lot of people were coming and saying, I'm doing my vision board, nothing's happening. I'm focusing, I'm paying attention, I'm doing everything that I need to do, and this is not manifesting. What's going on here? So I developed an understanding of what I call the law of deflection. That's the opposite, of course, of the law of attraction. What is this law of deflection? Well, that's the energy that's keeping an asteroid from hitting the Earth right now. So if we are um, going to meet up with 100 people, we're going to walk by 100 people, and let's say we connect with and meet one person. That's the law of attraction, no doubt about it. Everything for a reason, it is what it is, we were supposed to meet that person. But there's another law and effect there that in fact kept those other 99 people from coming into our energy. So I developed a theory that when we use the law of attraction and when we specify to the universe what we want, there's nothing wrong with that, but what we are in effect doing is limiting the universe's ability to be creative and to bring us the things, you know, I've got a blue Volkswagen waiting outside and you know what, I can't see it because I'm focused on something else. So consider when you are working with these slides, consider when you are working with manifestation in your life, that all you really need to do is set out to the universe what you don't want. And if we look at the old ways of looking at that, that's like focusing on, focusing on the negative. It's not actually. You just decide what you don't want and let the universe show you what comes in from there. Now, in terms of prognostication, seeing the future, one might wonder how that coexists with free will. And I have also a, a theory on that. When someone comes in to sit down with me and I'm, I'm doing a reading with them, one of the first things I do is I explain it all to them. This is how this is happening. This is my theory on where your loved ones are. Can I say that I am actually 100% bringing through people from the great beyond? I can't assert that. I can say that I have a process that when I sit down across from someone, I get pictures in my mind, and when I share them, they make sense. So when we're looking at the future, I like to think of it as a row of, um, well, like a film reel almost. A row of slides or negatives that are out in front of us at any given time. Our free will is always in effect. There's no doubt about it. But we do have a set of pre-existing probabilities that are there every day. So if we teach in a school, there's a good probability we'll be in that school. So all of these are laid out in front of us like these slides. As soon as we make an intention or create a plan or decide we're going to do something, like today, as soon as you decided to come here today, this became the most likely place you'd be right now. And that slide starts to solidify. It starts to, it's like a hologram and it starts to get more and more and more and more solid. And each moment that went by between then and today, that nothing changed it, that your free will didn't change it, or nothing came along, that got closer and closer and closer and closer to you. So what an intuitive does when they're looking into potentials in your future is they just see those slides. They see the slides that are moving the closest to you. It doesn't mean that they are set in stone. It doesn't mean that that intuitive has some magic vision over your life. What they're doing is looking at those most likely probabilities that are there. This is something that we all have the capacity to do. We all have the capacity to look at those things, and we all have the capacity to manifest and work with those slides. Now, many people try to move headlong into those. We know that when we're born here, we're, we are given a template. Even if we're raised with hippie parents that say, you know, go live in the woods. Have as many kids as you want. Just do what you're going to do. Even with that, we have a societal template of what looks like wholeness to us, right? 
Um, and, and it's very Stepford. That's what I like to call it. It's the nuclear family. Let's get all this into place. And, uh, you know, I see a lot of young women, well, young women more than young men, um, trying to get that forced into place by a certain period of time. So that's an example of someone having that future in front of them and trying very hard to dictate what those slides are going to look like. So it's not unusual that when we get there and we get everything into place, we start to feel like we're just going through the motions. When we talk about an ascension process or awakening, then what's happening is we're starting to live our lives basically standing still and letting those slides appear. And we're starting to, you know those people, just let the universe decide. <laughs> um, that's, that's kind of what that means. It's not that you're complacent or you don't have intentions or you don't care or have motivation or it has nothing to do with that. It's a matter of letting breadcrumbs emerge around you. It's a matter of letting those slides come into view a little bit and following that. Now, I had to do that. There was no Hogwarts. There was no tangible plan for someone um, that was doing what I was doing. I felt like a really big loser for a long time because everything I tried to do that fit into that template totally bombed. I'm so glad now that I understand that I had a path here and something else that I was supposed to be doing. I see so many beautiful souls on this earth sticking to that template, and you can see that they want to get free. You can see that they want to make changes in that template that's around them. And again, that's where understanding our personal freedom, our birthright, we have a birthright to do whatever the hell we want here. It's just the way it is. We don't want to harm anybody. Right? But if we want to live single forever, you know, if we want to, whatever we want to do, we actually have that birthright to do that. But this template that's there, um, that is what can often keep us from moving forward into that. So, um, remote viewing, um, you know, telepathy, we're all doing this all the time. And so part of my teaching is to get you to start looking at what you're already doing, looking at what your brain is already capable of. Start to recognize when you get a flash of a person in your mind and, and then they show up two days later. Uh, we can call it coincidence, absolutely. But I believe that this entire um, physical universe is built on a bit of a matrix. There's this matrix of information that's there. I can't prove it. Uh, I can't prove that I love anyone either. Love's not a provable entity. All I can do is take the images that I see in my mind, take the things that I've been doing in my life, and, and try to develop a theory from there. So I, um, I can read people on the phone that I've never met from anywhere in the world with simply a first name. And remember, I'm not here to brag. I'm here to talk about what you are capable of. I would certainly love for someone at some point to say, let's study that, because it's my usual day. You know, do a couple readings, have a banana, talk to some more dead people. I mean, that's really, that's technically <laughs> my usual day. And I continue to do it because of the feedback. Being a psychic is the same as, I mean, you can't self-diagnose psychologically. I've said it before, I'm not crazy, and that's debatable. Um, and and it's, the, it's the same thing with my work, right? It's about the person that I'm talking to. I want them to decide for themselves, what did this mean? Was there accuracy? Was there impact? Did it make sense to me? That's something that's never going to be able to be proven. That's something that we just need to experience. And, and I find that um, skepticism is extremely important when dealing with any type of this work. It is. I'm not saying to be skeptical about what's there or that it's possible. Um, cynicism, well, someone who really needs proof, at the end of the day, they're not going to find it. But if you visit a healer or an energy therapist or a psychic of any, any kind, there's things to remember. One, let them tell you. Um, there is definitely a thing, there's a thing called the Barnum Effect and there's a thing called cold reading. And that's why I like the phone readings. It's more challenging. I can't see them. I can't see whether there's wedding rings. I can't see how old they are. The Barnum effect, of course, is, is a theory that um, all psychics work on generalities. No doubt there's generalities in it. There's generalities in, in physical existence. You know, half of us are male, half of us are female. 
doesn't make it wrong. If someone comes in and uh, you sit down to have a reading and they say, well, you know, I'm seeing uh, there's a man. Um, he died. <laughs> he loves you and happy birthday next year. That's not enough. <laughs> That's not enough. Um, now, imagine it, though, for a psychic, it's like when I started reading, it's like someone walking across a field. Of course, it's general at first. All I can see is that it's a person. As that energy starts to move closer to us, we start to see more details. So I can start to see, well, that looks like a male or a female. As they get closer, I can see that they're wearing matching flannel shirts. Um, or I can see their hair color or their eye color, and then they get even closer, and, and I might get their name. You need to require details from people. And, you know, because that's important. Those are called validation messages. If someone comes in from the other side that was really angry, I'm going to see that at first for identification purposes only. <laughs> so um, I do experience different feelings. Of course, if I'm reading someone and there's been a murder suicide, that's going to feel differently, um, you know, than a situation where that's not there. But I still have to say they're just different frequencies of energy. High vibrating frequencies, lower vibrating frequencies. And we all have that here in our physical life. We all know the feeling of being around or being connected with what we might label a toxic person. And um, it, it, it literally on a quantum level can slow our energy down. That's why we say that person really brought me down or made me feel heavy. Um, on, on the other hand, we have people who have lighter energy. You know, and these tend to be the people who now they're working on finding their superpowers. They practice emotional intelligence so that in any circumstance they find themselves in, they will look at their own part in it, they'll look at their own role and, and see what they can do. They're, they're empowered. Um, and these individuals do tend to enlighten. So this is where, um, like I said before, global change, collective evolution, awareness, um, does have to do with the, with the individual. So we can look around on this earth periodically and feel like there's really nothing we can do. And um, there's always absolutely something that we can do. And that is, it's just about looking at self, looking for some of our superpowers, looking in there and finding out, you know, what is it that I'm good at? What is it that I feel? What is it that I experience when I'm around other people? So we're all psychic. Um, but uh, we certainly, like I said, it's not for everyone to develop except for themselves. You know, we, we want that trust. Just to be able to trust our own intuition. Just to be able to, you know, make that decision. I wonder if that's an urban legend, the guy who turned around, he had a bad feeling when he was getting on the Titanic. <laughs> Does anybody know whether that was an urban legend or not? That's the kind of ways in our daily life that, that this can help us. But also just to trust our feelings because those chakras, they're, they're like plugins and they connect to the people around us. So if we get a spinning here, that's telling us one thing. If we meet someone and we get a spinning here, that's telling us another. And the difference, of course, between instinct and intuition is that intuition happens in the mind, instinct happens in the body. If you get an image up here that tells you to put up a red flag, trust it. If you get a spinning in your tummy and you didn't eat any bad shrimp, you know, trust that. If you see both of them at the same time, run like hell. <laughs> so um, this is just a basic overview of a few things. I know I kind of went all over the place. That's precisely what I do. Uh, there's about 18 things on here that I didn't uh, get to. What I really want to do is um, just thank everybody for coming out to this today. Because this is about rhythms, it's about energy. We're made of earth, we're made of stone, soil, water, light, electricity. Um, basically, we just, we're all recycled matter. And in each of us, on a quantum level, we have those acacia records, the blueprints of the entire um, existence uh, is there in all of us. Um, it'd be a lot to access all of it on an individual level, but we can do our part to, to see what we have going on psychically, intuitively, and, and grow so we can share that with other people and inspire other people. So at the risk of um, not rambling for the rest of the day, I'm going to say thank you very much, especially the people out there in the back that I can't see. Thank you. <laughs> 
All right, um, I'm going to I'm going to total off and allow the next speaker to get up here because we're a couple minutes off today. Thank you so much.